Um, what did we learn yesterday? What did we do yesterday? Did anyone have a light bulb moment of when we were doing something? Yeah, it was it was really neat. I tried the uh, Flexbox Froggy thing. <laughs> it yeah, it I've only done one lesson. I found it a little complicated at the end, but it's cool. Like I can see where it'd be really useful. If it makes you feel any better, the last exercise in Flexbox Froggy took me 45 minutes. So it, Flexbox Froggy has almost like an, uh, an exponential curve in terms of difficulty. And uh, it starts out really easy and you go, oh, okay, flex end and justify content. And yeah, we're good to go. And then all of a sudden you get to the last one and you're like, there are too many frogs and there are too many lily pads and I don't know how to get them all in the right place. Yep. So um, <laughs> not something that necessarily you need to get to level 24 in, which is the last level, but um, getting up to level 20 can be really, really helpful in getting things to move around and figuring that kind of stuff out. Yeah. What else did we learn yesterday? Did anyone have that light bulb moment where you felt like, I get it. Like I, I was doing it before I it was working, but now I get it, get it. For me, Max, yeah. I'm sorry I'm to cut you off, Tina. No, you're fine. All right. For me, um, when you showed me on the free code academy, free code camp, whatever, how I can kind of like skip ahead just to cheat a little bit in case I get stuck. So that 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 helped me out a lot. Awesome. Yeah. And that is a trick that uh is not only good for that assignment, but we will be going back to free code camp for um some of the JavaScript exercises as well. Um, so that that will be good. Anything else from yesterday that stood out or anything else that you would like recovered? I like that uh, coolers option. So you can choose the colors you want for your frame. So Yeah, coolers is a is a great tool. Uh, you know, there's so many possibilities and hex colors out there. Um, and that is a good design tip as well, right? Is we like to think about our one color that we like and we stick to it. But oftentimes when you are working at a company, they will have something called a, a brand style guide, right? Which is all of the, the different colors they use and how they want their logo to be used and different variations of that. But um, when you're working on a project, it's very easy to be like, oh, this is a, a pretty color and oh, this is another pretty color. And then you look at your design and you're like, oh, this is very ugly. Those colors do not go together at all. Um, so using a tool like coolers can help generate all of that. And then you have those hex codes kind of locked in uh, that you can use them on the rest of the project. So you'll see kind of as the portfolio project comes together, all of the colors kind of match with each other. And that's because we use the tool to generate that palette before we dove in and started using them directly. Anything else? The keyframes. Keyframes. Talk to me about keyframes. What was that used for? So I was looking at the code from yesterday when we have our animation. And based on what I'm really looking at the code again, when we are doing a fade in, the keyframes goes further into depth into the fade in. So it goes, lets us know what, I guess, opacity we want it to go from and when it stops, like a from to two. Now, I would assume we're going to learn more about keyframes, but as of right now, it's it's used for fading. Yeah, so we won't do a ton with keyframes only because CSS animations is one of those like cool things that I like to touch on um, and say like, hey, if you're interested in doing more animation work, you can, you can you know, learn more about keyframing. Um, keyframing is a technique that is used in all kinds of animation, not just um, CSS animation, right? So um, if you're learning other tools, keyframing is something that you'll use in video editing or in, in uh, game design or stuff like that. 
Um, so we won't be doing a ton of CSS animations ourselves, but the thing with keyframes that's kind of interesting is that you can keyframe any CSS property um, starting from your, your starting position and going all the way to your ending position. So we use opacity, but opacity is something that we can use in CSS outside of uh, just keyframes, right? Um, and so any CSS property like margin top or color or um, lots of different properties that you can use in those keyframes to kind of build your animation from scratch. Okay, anything else before we dive into class today? Any concepts that need to be re-reviewed? All right, I want to give you guys a quick outline of where we're headed. So today we are going back to the portfolio site. We're going to build out our contact form to kind of get started and our project section. From there, um, tomorrow, we're actually going to change focus a little bit and start talking about your capstone. We're going to introduce you to the idea of your capstone. We're going to go through kind of all the requirements of your capstone. Um, and on Thursday, what we're going to do is we're going to shake up the format of class a little bit. We're going to uh, break out and do one-on-ones. I'll generate a random list, a random order of uh, all of your names. And what we're going to do is pull you into breakout rooms um, and talk about uh, your capstone, what your idea is, how you're going to go about um, accomplishing it, the different requirements we have throughout the program to make sure that you're keeping up with the capstone. Um, what we find is you're so you get so um, you get kind of tunnel vision, right? You're so focused on what you're learning in class and working on your homework that you reach that point where you're like, oh, it's three quarters of the way through the program and I haven't even started my capstone yet. Um, so what we do is we are going to provide you guys requirements um, throughout the program to say, hey, a week or two after we complete the HTML module or the JavaScript module or the APIs module, this is what you should have done in your capstone, which is challenging because every uh, capstone is going to be unique in what they're accomplishing. But that's why we're going to spend that time on Thursday, kind of one on one talking through your idea. We'll also have something for you to work on so that hopefully your homework uh, on Thursday, uh, I'm sorry, hopefully your, your weekend homework can get accomplished um, while everyone else is kind of in those one-on-ones. And you can use that time to bounce ideas off of each other while we're doing one-on-ones with, with you guys individually. As a group, you can kind of talk through your ideas and go from there. Alba, do you have a question? Can you put the outline for day two? Uh, yes, I will post that right now. Um, okay, should be live in Canvas now. Um, we have a lot uh, broken down from the um, last time we did this project in cohort three that is kind of linked out in different steps. Um, so if you have any questions um, about any of that, you can go from there. Um, but this outline is a little light only because um, we've got it broken down into different documents um, that may be more uh, useful in the, um, in the resources section. Um, and I'm gonna, take out this homework for now. Still working on figuring out what the homework will be over the weekend. Any questions about where we're headed? Okay, um, we are going to dive right on in. Give me one second.
it's uh, funny that Zoom was acting up yesterday and today Canvas seems to be the troublemaker. Well, there's always got to be something, right? Um, okay, let's dive in. Uh, I got to adjust my computer here, sorry. Okay. I'm going to share my screen here, close out of that. Okay. To get started, we are going to duplicate our week four day one folder into a week four day two folder. So I'm going to go to my desktop. I'm going to open up my my code folder. I'm going to open up week four. And I'm going to take my day one folder, right click on it and hit duplicate. That's going to give me my day one copy. I'm then going to right click and rename that as day two. Now, in a normal project, when you're going to work, right, you're never going to be duplicating that code over and over again. But we find that breaking this down day by day makes it a little bit easier when you're going back and you're checking in on this project to see the progress over, the, over a time period, right? So that's why we separate out the code that way. If that drives you crazy and you're like, I just want to have one folder called you know, portfolio and just work in that one folder, that's okay. You don't necessarily have to follow this day-by-day -day breakdown. We just find it helpful uh, in order to be able to separate out your code like that. So we're going to show you a little shortcut today. Instead of going into VS Code and going to File Open Folder, what you can do is you can take this Day 2 folder, drag it right down to your VS Code icon in the dock, and when you let go, you will notice VS Code pops that open directly for you. So you don't necessarily need to go to File, Open Folder, and navigate through everything. Um, that's a good tip that works on most icons in your dock if you're trying to get something open. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, what you're trying to open is the Day 2 folder, not anything inside of it. While you are in there, I will go ahead and do a... Um, a live share for you guys. I just posted that link in the uh, in Slack. Um, a reminder that when you are in VS Code to join the live share before you do anything, go to File New Window so that you're in your own window over here on the left, not the bottom. Over here on the left, click on the live share icon. Go ahead and click the join button, and that's where you're at the bottom. You'll want to do your sign in as anonymous, um, or go ahead and paste that link in at the top. And I will give everyone a couple minutes to join that live share. Once you get all of that set up, you can go ahead and click on your go live button on your own window, and that will pop open where we left off yesterday, which is our header section at the top, a little about section, and then we left off with this contact and the text goes here down at the bottom. So I'm going to pause there, give everyone a minute to get the live share open, and if you have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand and we can get to you. Uh, I will also launch a poll <laughs> to make sure... Uh, you guys are following along. Hmm. Max. Go ahead. Yes, um, sorry. Do you, um, I meant to ask this yesterday, but do you by any chance have any, any um, reading for this week assigned? Um. I will find some resources for Flexbox um, and the Bootstrap Grid. Let me write that down so I don't forget. Um, Max, do you want me to pull them from the previous cohort list Karen and I have? And um, I can add them later tonight. Do you have Bootstrap Grid and Flexbox specifically? Uh, only for my cohort, not in the man or the uh, master list yet. Um, 
Yeah, can you send me a link for that master list? That might be something that we want to share with students sooner rather than later. Um, let's get that together. And I know I will certainly have readings for uh, JavaScript. JavaScript's where we start to turn up the heat a little bit. You guys, uh, Flexbox Froggy uh, out of the out of the water and into the frying pan kind of thing. Uh, JavaScript is uh, coming up. I will certainly have readings for that. Um, the readings for this upcoming week are going to be more optional. Are going to be more of like, hey, if you want to do a deeper dive or you're struggling on the current content. Um, that's what the readings will be for this upcoming week. However, for the following week, um, it's going to be more DevOps. I also need to reach out to Nathan for any pre-readings, and then we get into JavaScript. So um, I will, uh, now that I have those on my list, I will try and uh, get them to you uh, before tomorrow's class. Perfect, thank you. And we should also have the quiz, um, the quiz up for you to fill out before Wednesday's class. Um, Ariel, that should be top priority over everything else that we talked about. Which was that? You just cut out really bad. I'm sorry. The uh, quiz for tomorrow's class, that should be top priority. Yep. Already on it. Perfect. Okay, uh, most of you guys are voted in the polls. Anyone need help getting your windows open and the live share joint? See, you didn't believe me when I said this does get easier, but you're getting in the swing of it, right? We're making our files, we're getting our day duplicated, we're joining the live share, we're getting more flexible and, and comfortable with VS Code. <laughs> Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in here. I'm gonna open up my index.html and my style.css. So I have them in two different tabs. In VS Code, when you single click on a file, it opens it in a new tab. When you double click on the file, it uh, overwrites whatever tab you currently have open with the file that you're clicking on. So a little, a little VS Code uh, tip for you there. In the style.css, I'm going to drag that over onto my right-hand side because just like yesterday, I'm going to be flipping back between those two files. If that's something that you find annoying, if you like switching back between your two files, this is all personal preference, right? So hopefully you guys are picking up on what you find most useful at this point um, and, and getting used to uh, following along in the live share, following along in our code and kind of building from there. Last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new tab and I'm going to go to this uh, website that we've been modeling everything off of, right? So this is portfolio.maxmatthews, except the .ws is at the end. This is linked in the week four, day two outline as the finished site. So if you guys want to pull it from the finished site, you can jump to it right from there. Oh, get the outline out of here. Okay. So we left off with the form section, right? So we had this contact, want to get in touch, shoot me an email or fill out the form on the right. Um, the reason that I do that is I have found that it's nice. Sometimes people don't want to fill out the form. Sometimes people want to just write an email in their, their contact section, um, right to the person that they're trying to email. So we're going to get this working first, and then we're going to break down our contact form over here on the right. So to get started on that, we are going to go down and we're going to find where we want our code to go, right? And this is often a hard thing to say, hey, where did I leave off yesterday? I was working on something. I clocked out for the day. I come back in the morning. Where was I at in my code? So sometimes you can think of your future self and leave yourself a little message. So you could come in here and say something like a comment where you put in to uh, yesterday's date. So we could say 10, 17, which was uh, Monday. And sometimes you want to leave yourself a little note, right? So you could say something like left off here, need to get text to show up, right? Just leaving yourself a little note. 
So we are saying it is not in the H1. We're down here in this row. We're on the left half of the column. And this is where we're trying to get things to show up. And this is where we have text ghost here. So just leaving that comment uh, as a little note for yourself to say, hey, when I clock out at the end of the day, where am I supposed to dive right back in, right? So we're going to get our text to go. Uh, we're going to delete our text goes here, and we're going to look at what our text is actually supposed to say. So I'm looking at my final version. It says, want to get in touch, shoot me an email or fill out the form. So that's what we're going to put in here. Want to get in touch, fill out the form on the, uh, fill out the form or shoot me an email. Okay. So I scroll down, I see my content is showing up there, but notice I've got this little email underline here. And if I click on that email, it actually pops open my email uh, editor and lets me send an email directly to the person with my email already filled out. Okay, well, that's pretty convenient. How do you think we go about making that work here? Anchor the email um, word. Exactly. So we're going to put an A tag in around the word email, and we're going to move our email into the A tag. Now we want to add an href to that. And I could just put in my email here, but the browser is going to be a little bit confused because the browser is like an anchor tag is used to link to another page. We need to tell our browser, hey, what we're sending here is our email. So we use a special prefix for that. We put in this keyword called mail to and a colon. That's what tells our A tag, hey, what's coming in here um, to uh, what's coming into this A tag is an actual email address. So now if we go over to our browser and we click on, um, Oh, I fixed that in a second. Uh, if we click on the word email, what will pop up is our email editor, and it will actually have your email address there. So you don't need to necessarily use my email here. You can put in whatever email address you would like, and then try clicking on that link in your live server and your go live and see if that link pops open into your email. Patrick, do you need help opening up the live share or are you good to go? Cool. Start a poll here. Make sure you guys are good to go with that mail to link. Almost. Oh, sorry, leave that up. And if you're not following along, that's totally okay. Just make sure that you get the concept of the href, the anchor tag, the mail to, all of that good stuff. Unrelated question. What's with the outfit? It is cold in my house, and I did not realize today that I was putting on a turtleneck until after it was on. <laughs> Okay, just curious. <laughs> yeah, he got the. Hey, Max, I'm not exactly sure what I'm supposed to be doing as I just hopped in. Sure. Um, so all we are doing, we are picking up where we left off yesterday with this row and the call six. To get started, what we did is we went into Finder into our uh, week four folder. We duplicated the day one folder by just saying duplicate and renamed that copied folder into day two. We opened VS Code uh, using the day two folder. We did file new window and joined the live share that's in Slack. And then the only thing that we've added so far is in this row call six, we deleted out that like text goes here and added in this line of code with the ahref and the mail to link.
When I um, put in the email link, it made a space between the email word and the next word. Um, okay, so make sure that there is a space before the A tag. Make sure there is a period after the A tag without a space. And then in here, there shouldn't be a space on either side of the A tag or of the word email, I should say, inside the A tag. And if you have all of that and it's still there, um, let me know and I can and you can share your screen. Good to go or you need help? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, perfect. All right, got most of the people voted in on the poll. Any questions before we keep going here? Okay, so now we need to get our form working, right? And we panic a little bit because if we're looking at our code, we're like, whoa, we've got rows, we've got columns here. I know that the form goes here. I know that's where it needs to show up, but how am I going to tackle this columns, getting these columns to show up? Think about it as its own mini grid system. We don't need to worry about this, this um, row and these columns showing up in context of everything else going on here. We, we can think about this as its own row. So if we just say, hey, this is a row on its own, it's got uh, something on the left and something on the right. That means that this is going to be a row in here and we are going to have two columns in it. I don't care about where, where that's going in. I just know that I need my rows and my columns showing up. I don't need to worry about it showing up in context of the call six in the row and the, uh, the contact section. I'm just gonna say, hey, I know my form needs to go here. I know I need a call six. And before we use any columns, the columns need to go in a row. So I say, hey, I need my row. So I do my div class row. Then I say, I need a call six. And I need my first name to go here. And I need to then come outside of this call. So I will say end call six for name. And I'm going to do another div class call six. Again, making sure that I'm still with inside of my row, but I'm outside of my closing call six div. And here I'm going to put last name. And then I am going to say end of call six for last name. Should probably put first name up here. So I save, I come over here and I see my first name and my last name. It's not an input, but I'm just making sure that my first name and my last name are showing up in the place that I want it to. Because otherwise, if I dive right into that input, I might overwhelm myself a little bit, right? So what I'm, I'm focusing in on there is making sure that they're just showing up in the right spot before I dive into my inputs itself. Max, you cool if I do a breakout room quick? Yep. Um, you should be co-host so you can make it yourself unless you need me to.
No, I broke it. Just shoot me a message of who you need in the breakout room and I'll do it for you. Checks out, I know. All right, thanks. You know what? I think I can just do... I just opened the breakout room. So whoever needs to go into it should be able to slide themselves in. Good to move on. Any questions? Okay. So now I need to get my input to show up, right? Because I'm trying to make it so that when you click into that, you can input your first name and your last name. So hopefully that is pretty easy after this weekend's assignment. We delete out the word first name and we put in our input. We need to tell it what kind of type that input is going to be. That is going to be a text input. And then I don't know if you guys uh, use this. I believe you did in the homework. We're going to put in the placeholder of first name. And then we need to close out our tag. We need, we're using that self-closing tag there because there's nothing going to show up between the opening input tag and the closing uh, input tag. So whenever we have an empty tag, we prefer to make that a self-closing tag. So I go ahead and save that. And my first name shows up, but it's being quite rude. It is overriding the width of my last name. And if I take that and I expand out my window here, it looks great when it's expanded out, but when I shrink it down, it overrides my last name. So I can fix that in my CSS. I'm gonna go down to the bottom of my CSS and I wanna be careful here because I don't wanna target all inputs in case I use an input somewhere else on the page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, target my contact section. And in the contact section, go find any input and make the width 100%. That width 100% is going to say, you should stay in your column. You should be 100% the width of the column. Let the column figure out the width for them. So now my first name shows up the way I want it to. And if I expand my window out, whoops. If I expand my window out, it grows based off of the width of the column but I can grab that down at the bottom and shrink it down. And now it's staying the width that I want it to. Okay, from there, I can get practice with my input tag. I'm going to make another input with a type of text. That's going to have the placeholder of my input last name. spelled wrong. Thank you. And so is name, apparently. <laughs> so now I've got my first name and my last name showing up. And I can drag that out a little bit here. I was zoomed in a little too far there. And now I've got my first name and my last name showing up. I'm going to pause there for a poll, make sure we're all understanding this. We are, we can pick up speed just a tiny little bit here. Beautiful. Okay, so if we compare my first name and my last name here to the first name and last name here, I notice that there's a little bit more white space. Right? There's a little bit more breathing room. It makes it feel more like a form, uh, less like a form and more um, like, hey, this is easy to fill out. I've got plenty of space to do so. Believe it or not, all that does is it comes down to padding. So all we need to do is while we're targeting our width 100% for the input, we can also add a little padding onto this. So we can just say padding 10px 
And if you notice, now our form inputs have a little bit more room inside of them to add our first name and last name placeholders. And when we type, it shows up nice with a little bit more breathing room. So we can go ahead and knock out the rest of this form. We come down here, we figure out that this div tag is closing out this row here. So we'll add in a comment there that says end of first row in form. We come down here, we make our new div. And inside of that div, we are going to throw an input. And this, we're going to use the type of email. And then we'll put a placeholder in there for our email as well. And then we come down, we do one more div. And this time, instead of using an input, we are going to use a placeholder that says, what's your message? And text areas are a little weird. Um, they do not, uh, closing tags on text areas are not preferred. There's, uh, there's a weird history with it, but basically we shouldn't be using a self-closing tag on our text area. We should always use um, a, a separate closing tag for that text area. So over here on the right, we run into some issues. My email is right up against my first name and my what's your message is all collapsed in. Well, what's going on? I said my width is 100%. Well, the width 100% is only applying to my input. A text area isn't a type input. So what I need to do is say also in the, oops, also in the contact area, grab any text area and make sure that the width is 100% and I've got the padding on it. Okay. Now that's looking good, but they're all crunched on top of each other. Well, just like we added padding to everything, we can also add a little margin on the bottom of it of 10 PX, and that will space out my form the way I want. So we're seeing our CSS now. It's not just the one-off. That CSS for the input and the text area are all getting applied here to the different inputs and text areas we're using so the CSS can apply to multiple areas. The last thing we need here is our button. So I'm gonna do a new div and I'm going to say a button that has the text of send message. Okay. Now this button looks quite ugly compared to this button down here. Now I could go through and apply a bunch of different CSS, but this is the first time that we're gonna touch into component uh, Bootstrap's component library. Bootstrap components, we've been using the grid system. We get the container, we get the rows, we get the columns. We know that that documentation exists, but Bootstrap is good for much more than just the grid system. Bootstrap has a bunch of predefined components for us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new tab and I'm going to go to getbootstrap.com. We've been on this site a lot already, but we've been kind of keeping to ourselves in this intro section, right, to get that link tag. We don't need the link tag here. If we scroll down, we get the layout, we've got the grid, okay? We've used some of that. We've used some of these utilities to get our flex working. But if we keep going down here, there's a whole form section. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Maybe we use that for the next project. I'm gonna keep going down here to these components and I'm going to find my buttons. So I pop open my buttons and there in the examples are all of these different buttons that I have available to me. And if I hover over the button, you notice there's a little animation that's going on there. There's a little roundedness to the button that looks a lot nicer. It's got the text uh, color set all up for me. I can use different colors. All of that's really cool. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this first button tag. This first button tag corresponds with this primary button that's showing up here. So I'm going to copy that whole tag, come over to my button over here, and I'm going to paste right on top of it. So I hit save, I go back to my code, and now I see this thing that says primary. Okay, I don't want it to say primary though, I want it to say send message. And I'm gonna get a little creative there, I'm gonna hit command uh, control space all at the same time and pop open my emoji picker and do a little search for a mailbox. If you prefer it to say message, you could grab an uh, envelope. You can grab one of these envelopes if you prefer that. I am going to do my little mailbox and I'm going to get the little uh, emoji there. And then when I hit save, I'm going to see my send message button appear over here on the right. Okay, this is nice styling, but it doesn't quite fit into my form. So because I've got my bootstrap going on, I can target my contact and dive right in to this BTN primary. I'm going to target that BTN primary and say, hey, I want the width to be 100%. Just like we made our inputs 100%, I can reuse that class name in my bootstrap in my own custom CSS and change the way that bootstrap is showing up by adding a width onto it. Okay, that's nice, but I want it to fit into my color scheme. This primary button color isn't quite going for what I want. So I'm going to add a background color to that right from my palette that I have pre-generated. And now my button is showing up the way I want it to. Contact button primary. Okay, that was a lot. Let's take a breather here. This is the end product. This is what should be showing up with our form inputs. Leave that up on the screen. We should have our form completed. And this is what our code is looking like. I'm going to go ahead and move this down onto the next line so you guys can see it a little bit easier. And if you do have this working, take a moment now to update your notes. If you're just following along, make sure you understand where did that BTN primary come from? How did we know that it was going to show up in blue? How are our inputs working? Do we understand the grid system, right? There's so much more here than just getting our code to work that we want to focus in on that. We want to focus in on making sure we understand what our code is doing and why. Mm -hmm. Exona, go ahead. Yes. So, um, my, my, um, what's your message is not the same length as yours. It's quite smaller. Okay. So check over in your CSS. What we did is we borrowed the work that we were doing on the contact input. And we also said, hey, the comma means I want this to apply to something else. Also apply it to the text area in the contact section. So check your CSS here. If this looks identical and you've got your text area over here, mm -hmm. then let me know and you can share your screen. Um, nope, I got it. I was just missing the hashtag under contact a text area. Beautiful. Thank you. Got 12 volts in on the poll. Glad to see that most of you guys are following along. Give everyone just a couple more minutes. Got another vote in there, and then we will move on.
this is a great project to kind of put to work to see how everything is laid out. The nice thing about That's teaching really is, is once you figure out what works well, you can mm -hmm. uh, reuse those projects and it just becomes easier and easier to teach it. So um, this is actually only my second cohort of, of teaching the majority of it. I've taught every cohort, um, but uh, the first cohort, I only taught three or four weeks. The second one, I, I taught like a quarter of it. Um, and then last cohort, I taught, uh, I don't know, around 80% of it. So um, these projects now get to the point where we're like, all right, we're in a rhythm here, right? Like we know what projects help and what ones don't. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple projects that we did in JavaScript that are great projects, but we did them in the wrong order. And so people were like way too complicated. And then they finished the project after it and then went, okay, now the project before it makes way more sense. So um, that's the nice thing about uh, being in the fourth cohort now is we've learned a lot of lessons and obviously there's always room for improvement, but uh, project-based curriculums are, I, I think the best way to learn programming. Um, and so if, if I believe in that, I also have to believe that the projects are are good, right? And, and we're doing the right ones. Yeah, no, this is... This is a good one. Good practice. Thanks for the feedback. All right, we got 15 votes in here. Do we have any questions? You guys feel the speed that we're picking up? You feel that we're making these sections a little quicker? We're understanding the grid system. We're using different components. We're feeling like we've got the CSS under control feel like we're actually making a real website here, right? Because we are. All right, so we move on to the next section down here and here's our portfolio, right? And our portfolio has a line of text and all right, we can figure all of that out. And there's a lot of styling going on here. <laughs> All right, that's cool. Let's let's take that one step at a time. Let's get our section working first. Well, we've got what we call div soup over here. We've got all kinds of tags that are indented. The most important thing about starting a new section is figuring out where the last one ended. So if we look over here, look at how many levels of indentation over here we are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight levels of indentation over just to get that send message to work. But at the same time, if we're following our indentation properly, we easily know that this send message is showing up in our button because it's indented properly, right? That need for indentation never goes away. In fact, some programming languages like Python will break and not run the code at all if your indentation is not correct. Fortunately, we aren't learning Python here. But what we are able to do is say, hey, this contact is showing up in this section. So if we follow this line all the way down to the ending section tag here, we know we must be in the right place. So we are going to make a new section tag. In that section, we are going to put, what have we been using? An H1. And we're going to call that our project section. Or do we, nope, I called it portfolio. Portfolio. And then we are able to put in our text from our portfolio. So our portfolio says, to view more details about the projects, click any of the cards. So I'm going to put that in as a P tag, a paragraph tag, and say to view more details about the projects, click on any of the carts. So I save that. I come back over to my live preview. I scroll down and you, that doesn't look pretty. We got to fix that. So we come back over to our CSS. We scroll up here and I've already got styling going on for my about and contact section. I want to go ahead and reuse those, right? Important that we dry out our code here because the color on these, actually, we're not going to do that because I'm looking at this and I'm saying the background color needs to be different 
for this section. And I don't want the color of the text in this section to be white because the background is so light, it would be hard to read white text on this background. So instead of reusing this section just to get the padding, I'm going to go all the way down to the end of my file, and I'm going to target my portfolio section. And in my portfolio section, I am going to say the background color. The background is going to come from my pre-made palette that I already made. If you guys are using a different palette, you are welcome to reuse that. Um, I'm going to drop in my background color. Um, don't know if this is the right one or not. Let's find out. And I'm going to add the padding on it of 30 PX. So it looks like the other sections. I'm going to scroll down. My background has not changed. My padding is not showing up. It's right on the edge. What step did we miss? Other than me not having a semicolon, which semicolon. also will not fix the pro problem. Don't you have to do background colon? I do. And it's still not working. What did we miss? I think you need to add a, uh, a portfolio uh, ID. Bingo. We've got our section over here. We were used to using our IDs, but we can't forget the little step. This portfolio ID here needs to link to my section tag over here. So I come back over. I add my ID of portfolio. And when I save... I get this showing up. OK, that's good, but this is not the right background color because I lost track of my palette and used the wrong one. There we go. That's the right color I needed to use. So if you need any of these hex colors, you can pull them right out of my live stream. Or if you're using your own coolers palette, you're welcome to use them in there. Just make sure that whatever font color you have showing up goes well with your background to make it easier to read that. Hmm. I'm going to pause there for a moment, let you guys catch up on anything that you need to, and then we will dive into getting our uh, projects to show up. I would please like some review about how you got click on the section below to span that whole area. So make sure that your opening section tag is below your closing section tag, but not before the closing div that has that container. Not before the closing div. By default, our section works just like a div. So it should go to the full width of the container without us needing to target anything. Hmm. I'm wondering if my section is in the wrong spot. Does it have to be right under the opening container or indented one? It has to be indented. It should be indented one. Do you want to share your screen and we can take a look? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. um, scroll down for me in your browser. Let's see what it looks like. OK, and let's go to your code. I noticed that your um, contact section is inside of your about section and should not be. Oh. So let's go to your code and let's clean some of that up. Let me bring that down here. Yes, please. Yeah. Nope, didn't go far enough. Uh, 
Um, okay. Um, your code is on the bottom now. Let me request remote control. And I'm going to see. So I want to go find. Here is our section. section and we um, have that working. That closes out. Then we have a section for our about. Mm -hmm. And that comes down um to here and then we close out that section oops and um let me see um i'm gonna just comment this out for now i'm trying to figure out let's see Section, closing section, section. Okay, so now we come down to your contact, your row, your call 12. I don't have a closing section there. Where is the rest of that supposed to be in a section? Um, all of this comes down to this closing section here. So hmm. those are right. That closes out your row. That closes out your column. We do another row. And you've got your left and your right columns that lines up. Um, end of second row. Okay, so get in touch, call. You did your row. You did your two columns. And now this row is done. So this closes your row here. Then these divs are all on their own. Text area, you've got your button, your closing button. Um, and then I don't think you need this div. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that's your problem, though. Um, I'm confused as to why. Um, let's take a look here. Um, yeah. You, your about section looks like it's in your contact section. I don't think it actually is. I think they're just sharing the same background color. So let's take a look. If we go into inspect here mm -hmm. and we hover over your about, you can see that line clearly ends there. And if we go into your contact, that clearly starts another div. Did you want the whole thing to have that? purple background color, or did you want it to look like the rows were purple? I wanted that whole section to have okay. a purple background. So um, let's find that's you did that here, but you targeted the H1 itself. We oh, don't I want the H1 to be that color. We want the whole contact section to be that color. Okay, there it is. And so now that fixes that problem. So it wasn't actually an issue with the, your indentation was right. Your divs were all right. It was just a matter of where are we applying that background color. Mm -hmm. And so we can also take that off here because now it's properly assigned to that whole section. So while I'm in here, I'm just going to find your placeholder. Um, and that placeholder isn't working because you've got an empty line in here. So if we kind of take that line out and bring this up, now we get your placeholder showing up as well. Okay, thanks. Placeholders are new to me because I didn't do anything in uh, Free Code Camp. So it was only after our office hours that I was knowing to do the inputs. Gotcha. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> okay. So you've got your send message working. Uh, that looks good. And now let's kind of go down to your section is closing out your section. All of your indentation looks right. I need now a here's a problem. So uh, let's go down. Different you were background color in there, don't I? Yep. You were starting work on that. So the padding we put at 30 PX. Um, do you have a color in mind? Um. Something slate blue. Slate blue? Okay. So now you've got your state slate blue. 
and it's spanning the it's the background is right but the problem here is you've got this in a call six so the call six is making it only be half the width of the screen but we're not using any columns yet we are going to take this one out and we're going to move this to an h2 and we're going to put an h1 in here of the portfolio so that section is properly labeled Ooh, okay and we'll fix our indentation before i let you go and you are good to go oh goodness thank you any questions mm -mm. no that was kind of awesome Tina, go ahead. Okay, so click on your week four, day two there in your browser. What do you mean in my browser? To pull your browser window back over. Oh. And in that listing directory, click on week four, day two. Yep. Oh, whoa. Okay, thanks. So the problem was that you didn't open in VS Code. You didn't open the week four, day two folder. You opened up the week four folder. And that's why it didn't know which one to pick. Did you want day one or day two to go live? Okay, thank you. Yep. <sighs> Any other questions before we roll forward with our next section? Hmm. Okay, so we're going to look at our final version here, right? I'm not sharing my screen. We look at our final version here, and the first thing that jumps out to me is three columns. And so I always like making sure my columns are working before I put anything in the columns, right? I want my layout to look right. So I'm still within my section for the portfolio, but I need to use columns. Before I can use my columns, columns always have to go in a row first. So I say I've got my div class row. Then I'm going to do three equal columns. Now I could do a call dash four here, right? Three fours add up to 12. But if we don't specify a number on them, they will automatically share the width of the row. So if I say first call, come down here and make another div class call and say second call and switch back over, you see it's sharing the width of the that row, right? They look like two sixes right now uh, because it's split in half. But the magic of this is if I add another div class call here and say third call, I don't need to adjust all of the numbers. It will automatically show up in the right spot. It's just equally sharing the space between the three of them. Okay. That's cool. I'm looking here. I got my layout ready. Now I could build these, right? This is just a white background and it's got some rounded corners and it's got a button at the bottom, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. If we go to bootstrap back to the documentation here, if you had it closed, go ahead and just go back to getbootstrap.com and click on docs up at the top. There is something called a card. If I scroll down here and look at the card here, and go down to the example. Oh, would you look at that? That is convenient. That looks like exactly what we want to use. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to copy this whole div class card. There's also a little clipboard icon here that you can click on, on and that will copy it to your clipboard. Now we need to be really, really careful of where we're pasting this. I want this to show up in my first column. 
So I'm going to highlight the words first call and I'm going to paste right on top of it. So I'm going to hit save on that. I'm going to go back and I'm going to see what the damage is. Okay, not terrible. My card is showing up. If I take this and I drag it out to expand the window a little bit and bring it back in, okay, it's not quite playing nice. I know we've got a broken image, but this card is so wide, it's squeezing down my other columns. I want it to just be the width of the column, just like I wanted my inputs to be the width of the column up top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out this dial with uh, 18RN. And when I save that, now my, my card is playing nice and it's taking up the right width, right? That's just part of the example Bootstrap is giving us. We don't necessarily need to use all of Bootstrap's code like the width because we are happening to use this, this card in a column that is already controlling the width. Okay. So now I come back over here and I see weather app. Well, it kind of makes sense that the card title is our weather app. And then down here, I've got some text, first front end project modeled after a weather app. So I'm going to take my card text. I'm going to take out what's in that P tag in between the P tag, not the P tag itself, and say first front end projects um modeled after a weather app so i come over here now i see everything's popping in here doing what i want and i've got this go somewhere all right we'll fix the text of that go somewhere in a minute right now we're looking at this btn primary well what do you know that btn primary is the same btn primary from up here and if you look, this button looks a lot like this button. The only thing is, is the background's a little different. But I want that background to apply to both buttons. So I go to my CSS. I come up to this BTN primary here. And I say, you know what? I want all of my button uh, primaries to have this background color. So I'm going to take out the contact section here and make that BTN primary apply to all buttons. Take a break there. I'm going to relaunch the poll to see where you guys are at. We don't have cards in our second and third columns. We don't have our image showing up yet for our weather app. We'll get to that in a second. Right now, all we're doing is getting our card to show up. And if you notice, when you drag out the window here, you'll notice the card has a little bit more breathing room and looks a little bit more natural. That went so fast. Oh my God. Um, what did we change? We took out contact BTN. Yes. Just class. Okay, but this information's still the same. So we copied and pasted the card from our bootstrap. Mm -hmm. The first bootstrap example, we copied this whole thing and pasted it instead of it saying first call. We took out first call. We made sure we were in that call div and we pasted in our entire div there. Oh, can I look at the website that you have open, please? Mm -hmm. So it was the first card. Yep. And it was the whole thing. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And then we took out the style width 18 REM because we wanted our width to be controlled by the column, not the card itself. And then we started going through, we left the image tag alone, but then we replaced everything in the H5 and the P tag with our own content. And we still have a couple votes shy of uh, majority to roll forward. So we will give you guys a couple minutes to catch up here. Let's see if I butchered my, oh yeah, I butchered it. Okay.
Do you have a tiny little picture icon above your weather app? Yes, we'll fix that in a second. Thanks, okay. Oops, sorry. Mark Sherrell, go ahead. You are muted. Sorry. All right. And on my project in the card section, none of the words are showing up. Okay. Go ahead and share the screen. Let's take a look. All right. Okay. Um, if you highlight where the word should be, let's see if the words are there, but they're there in white. Uh -huh. um, so what we can do to fix that, let me request remote control. You should have on your monitor uh, allow. Perfect, thank you. Now in here, that's a simple fix. All we need to do is say, hey, when we're using a card, set the font color back to black. Ah, uh, okay. And you're good to go. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So now we run into the fun part. I'm going to go to my example website. If you uh, don't have this pulled up, I would do that. And we're going to borrow these three images just because I already have Can them you generated. Your Sorry. I kick myself every time <laughs> I do that. Okay. Um, I'm going to pull up my portfolio site if I don't have it already open. It's uh, also linked in the outline. I'm going to right click on this image and I'm going to go down to copy image address, right? Not copy link address, copy image address. We're just going to borrow my three images, which normally from a copyright perspective, you should never, ever, ever use anyone's images from their site without their permission. However, you have my permission to use these in the, uh, in the meantime. So we're going to hit copy image address here. We're going to go back over to our code and, um, Bootstrap has given us those three dots there, right? That's our little placeholder. So I'm going to go ahead and paste that in and hit save. And when I come back over here, my image shows up. Okay, this is cool. Instead of linking to weatherapp.png in our source tag, if we put HTTPS at the front of it, we can actually link to an image anywhere on the internet. Again, Watch your copyright, make sure you link to images with permission. But now we've got our weather app showing it up. So you might be tempted at this point to go knock through your other two columns. But we've got this random dot, dot, dot in here. This is an alt tag that goes back to screen reader accessibility for uh, people who may be um, hard of, of seeing. They still need to be able to interact with the internet. So in this alt tag, we don't want to just say picture. What we want to do is be descriptive. This is the alternate thing that will show up if either the image isn't loading or if someone hovers over the image and or if a screen reader is going through and announcing to the user what is showing up on the screen. So this, we're going to say weather app screenshot. Every image tag you use in order to be uh, ADA accessibility compliant should have a descriptive alt tag. And it's very tempting to put the alt tag as everything is just picture, but that's not helpful to the user, right? So what we're trying to do is describe what is showing up in this image. So if we save that, go back over to our portfolio and hover over the section uh, over the e image, it's going to show me up. It should eventually show our alt tag. And I'm not quite sure why it's not. Um, but from an accessibility uh, standpoint, it is important that uh, we put in our descriptive alt tags. So 
We are going to get over the final stretch here in the next five minutes. We're going to go take everything that is inside of our call, right? Maybe it's helpful. I'm going to say end of card here so we know where we're at. I'm going to take my cursor from the start of the card, bring it all the way down to the end of the card, copy that and paste it in my second call and in my third call. I'm going to save that. And if I come over, I should have my three weather apps. From there, I want you guys on your own to make it look like the live site on both the feedback form and on the Netflix project that we're gonna be starting next week. So don't be afraid to right click on this and hit copy image address for both the feedback form and the max flips. Go ahead and do that on your own. Try and get this section to look like this section. And we'll give you guys like five, 10 minutes to work on that. If you get stuck or need help, let me know. I'm going to do it myself without screen sharing, but I want you guys to try that on your own. Can you repeat that? Yeah, we want the live site, uh, this section and th this card to look properly, to look, our code here should look like this over here. So you're going to right click on these images and copy image address and put them in the right spot over here. And then you're going to update the text in the H5 and the P tag in order to have the right content inside of it. Give it a stab. If you're lost, if you need help, just raise your hand. I'm going to try it myself, right? So what we would put for the Maxflix is just for the alt text Maxflix uh, screenshot. You got it. Max, how am I targeting just the picture in your weather app part, but not the rest of it? You mean when you're trying to get the link? Mm -hmm. You just right click on the photo. You can go down to copy image address. Huh. So I'm just getting like weather app screenshot. So make sure nothing is highlighted on the screen. In my live site, you're gonna right click on the photo and go down to copy image address. Uh -huh. And then when you come back over to your SRC tag in your code and paste it, you should get my website weather app PNG. Mm, yep, I have that. Okay, I just have to look at this for a minute because I'm missing something. Sure. Mm -hmm. This is the end result that we're going for. I'll give you guys at least a couple more minutes to catch up to that. If you want, you can cheat and look at my live share and see what it looks like in the live share compared to what your code looks like now. But I would recommend not doing that. Try and work through it yourself and figure out what you can update to make it look like this.
Should we change the go somewhere to make it rain? Like in your um, weather app? You can if you'd like, or uh, you can use your own button text. The idea here is that when we come back from break, we're going to work on building out um, this project page where we have all of that information inside of it. So you can get creative here and make the button say whatever you want. Yeah, I'm lost and I don't know where. Share your screen. So that was more of a narrow column. Okay, let's look at your code. Okay, so first thing I noticed, you've got some red in your CSS, so we should try and fix that. So let me request remote. Yeah, I'm not sure how. So your closing bracket for this needs to go down here, and then we need to specify a color. I think you had slate in here before. Um, portfolio. Oh, you know what? We're missing a closing brace up here. Yeah. Okay. And then we can put this back to slate blue. Now... <laughs> background set up, right? So let's look here. We've got our row, we've got our call, we've got our class for the card. We close out the card here. Um, but if we look at what's highlighted here, this we think is the end of the card, but the computer is saying it's the end of the card body. So we somehow lost a closing div here to close out the card body. Then we end up closing out the card now in the right spot. Um, and so this should be the end of our call. So let's see, we click on div. Now this div is closed out properly and we're in the right screen size. Yes. So the last thing we need to do is when we copied and pasted the link, we missed the closing quote and accidentally overwrote that. So now that is all working. Uh, we've got our image source, and now we've got two class equals here. That's causing issues. Okay. So let's take those out, save that. And now we are back in business. Oh my goodness, okay. Give the next one a shot myself. Thank you. Yep. If we are done, um, may we go on break or do you want us to wait? Yep, go on break, be back at 7.30. Bobby, go Thank ahead. You. I just want to know why uh, on my contact section, why the, like the, the boxes aren't to the right, they're under contact. Share your screen, let's take a look. that and we go to the code all right you got to be close it's got to be something with your calls not lining up let me request remote and let's take a look so i'm going to scroll up in your code here okay so 
Your contact section has a row. This goes all the way across. Then you've got your row and your call six, but you finish your row here. So you see how that's underlining or, or it's matching up. We yeah. don't want the row to be done here. We don't want the row. We want the row to be done all the way down here. Okay. So we're going to take out this closing div because we're not done with that row yet. We want the this call six to be with this call six. Then we're going to take this whole section and tab it over. Then we have this div is now closing out this div. This div is closing out that div. So this should come over to line up with our row. And then this row needs to be done here. So this div is closing out this row, which means this whole row comes over one. And now row closes out. We open another row. We've got one column and two columns. This column closes out with this column. This div closes out with our second row. And this section is closing out the whole thing, which drum roll please means we are back in business. There we go. Thank you. No problem. Stick around for the next four minutes in case anyone needs help, and then we will go on break for everyone. What time do we have to get back by? Wait, can we, are we, are we on break? I, I'm around for the next couple of minutes if you have okay. a question. Otherwise, go on break, yes. Okay. Question, do you want me to wear my turtleneck? No. Okay, I'm so I'm not is, harping. I like his yeah, turtleneck. Yeah. You know I like turtlenecks. <laughs> what is Mr. Drippy? What show have I not watched that I need to? Okay, it's so not a show. I said you had drip. Yeah, Mr. Drippy is from fucking uh, Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch. It's a Studio Ghibli game. Before we pick up speed again, does anyone need help? Is anyone stuck, does not have something that looks like this? Christina, go ahead. Yeah, I'm lost. Share the screen. Let's see where you're at. Um, I will get this down. I swear. Uh, share. Okay. Share. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Okay. It does nothing. That's fine. We haven't linked it yet. You're all caught up. I am? Yep. Oh, boy. Okay. Wow. I thought I was so lost. Nope. You're good to go. Okay. We're going to do the linking and this is the next step. Uh, Jennifer. Hey, thanks. <clears throat> Can't figure out what I'm missing to have my get in touch, first name, last name, and all of that go all the way across. Okay, take a look. Um, so mine is mobile responsive. That's something that we'll get into a little bit later. I request remote control. Uh, when we grab your window and resize it here, it is going all the way across. 
what mine does right now, it's mobile responsive and it's pushing the form down underneath it. We haven't gotten to that quite yet. We'll get into that uh, probably tomorrow. Okay, thank you. So let me just scroll down. You got all this good. So you're also all caught up and good to go. Anyone else? Okay. So we are going to, there are two things that I noticed that I want to fix before we move on to getting these, these buttons working. One, I've got this really ugly email, right? That hyperlink is blue on blue. It's driving me nuts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go find that in my code. Um, this is the A tag, but I don't want to grab every A tag. I only want to grab A tags that are in my contact section and change the color of them. So I'm going to find where I have my contact CSS. The order doesn't really matter, um, but it's good to kind of cluster your CSS uh, code together. So it makes it easier to find the different pieces of it, right? So I'm uh, right underneath the contact input. I'm going to target my contact section again. I'm going to target the A tag, and I'm going to make the color white. So now when I switch over here, I got my email still showing up as underline, underline so we know it's a link, um, but a uh, little bit easier there. The other mm -hmm. thing I'm going to do is down at the bottom of my section, I've got a little copyright 2022. It's always nice to kind of anchor your site out with a footer. So we're going to go all the way back down to the bottom of my HTML. And instead of doing another section, I'm going to actually use the footer, right? This is called semantic HTML. It just makes it easier for, again, those uh, accessibility reasons, the screen reader, to be able to read this aloud and say, hey, the content in this section is not just a generic div, it's actually the footer of the site. So to get my copyright sign, I'm going to use my emoji picker again. Control command space is going to pop up the emojis. Um, I have my copyright uh, in my frequently used, but if you do a search for copyright, um, you can grab either one, either the first one or the second one. The second one is actually going to be the like Unicode text symbol for it when this is an actual emoji. So the second one is actually a little bit better to use because it will respect light mode and dark mode. Um, on people's computers if you have it set that way or on their phone. Um, but I'm going to grab the copyright sign here. I'm going to say 2022 and my LLC's name. I'm going to come back over here and scroll back down. And where's my footer? Well, again, if we highlight the text, we can see it's actually down there. We just need to um, highlight that and bring that up. So I'm going to go back to my CSS. I'm going to target my footer. And here I don't have a class or a um, I don't have a, a class because I just want to target the generic footer. And what I'm going to do is put in my background color, uh, which I actually want to be black here. I want my text to be white. I want to put my padding on it, just like I've done for my other sections. And if I save that and come back over here, now I've got my footer showing up in black and I am good to go. And it's kind of anchoring out the site. Pausing there before we move on. So is it a good rule of thumb to have padding and if you're making projects like this or if you're creating websites like this, to have padding be 30? Is that like a... Not necessarily. It, okay. it depends. Um, okay. That gets kind of more into UX design than it does into like the coding aspect of it. There's wow. no like universally agreed upon 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 pixels of padding, right? Okay. Um, if you go all the way up to the top here, obviously this top section is a lot more than 30 pixels of padding. Right. Would that look 
okay if I only had 30 pixels of padding on it? Yes. But I did a design choice there to say, hey, make that a, a big section, make that a kind of a statement piece mm -hmm. before you move on. Okay. Um, so there are um, design principles. Um, mm -hmm. One of them is uh, called material design. And you can actually go through an entire course that I don't want to say gives you the formula, but gives you mm -hmm. like these design principles of how big the padding should be or why the color should be a different, uh, you know, why the colors should align on the color wheel, or um, there's an entire fork that you can go down where you could get through this program and be like, hey, I learned all the JavaScript, I did the backend stuff, I worked in the database, but where I want to specialize in is that UX design. And then maybe I am uh, I'm both a designer working in Figma or Sketch or Photoshop, but I also know how to build those sites out, right? Because whenever you're looking at a really polished website, um, the vast, vast majority of time, that website did not start with a, a developer. It started with a designer. Mm -hmm. It started with someone who planned that entire mock-up out in a, a visual program kind of played around with it and then either handed it off to or built themselves out the HTML and the CSS to look like that. Gotcha. Um, so there is no like, I picked 30 because 30 looked good to me. So that's what we're using, right? Okay. Um, but that is not to say that there are design principles and rules out there. Um, mm -hmm. I just am not a designer to teach them. Gotcha. Okay. It's a very good question though. Thank you for asking that. Okay, Tina. I was going to ask this almost the same question. Um, like, so you you were not going to learn the UX part of it, you said, but how are we going? Is when when we're in a job and we're doing the the um, the the math of it, you know, the different the numbers, pixels, and all that. How are we going to know what goes where, when, and what? You know what I mean, like. So if you're, it, it depends on what job you're hired into, right? So if you're hired in um, as a full stack developer, most jobs will recognize how hard it is to be a full stack developer and say, hey, you're not a designer, right? You're not going to be able to be someone who can make it look super pretty and also be able to make it super functional. That's too big of a job role. So in a position like that, they will either contract with a, a UI designer um, or they'll have someone on your team who does that, right? So one of the first people that we hired um, was a senior UI designer who makes mock-ups, right? And their entire job at my company is to go into a UI design software and say, here, this is what I want you to make. This is what it's supposed to look like. I did all the pixel math for you. So when I go in and implement those mockups, I can actually see, oh, this is 30 pixels away from the other one. Let me drop that padding in there and move on. So it, it depends what kind of job you're in, right? If you're in a very small startup company, they may not have the resources to have a designer on staff, at which point you say, hey, um, I can create a wireframe for you and I can kind of lay all of this out and get all of that information on the screen, but it's not going to be the prettiest website you've ever seen, right? And that's when oftentimes you'll say, you know, can we hire a designer or can we get what we call the MVP out, right? The minimum viable product um, where it, it might not look super pretty, but at least you'll be able to, you know, have something functional um, and then move from there. Sorry, my headphones decided to attack me. Um, the, um, uh, so it, it, it just depends on the job role. Um, as a full stack developer, there are so many different things that you can focus in on, um, that you want to find the job description that matches for you. Right. And what you may find is that, um, a lot of companies will hire you as a front end developer first. They'll say, no, we don't really do full stack, start front end, start building sites for us. And if you prove that you can do that really well, you can work your way up into a full stack role. But it really depends on the company. Some employers don't hire any full stack developers. Some companies will say, we have a front end team and a back end team. And the back end team only writes back end code and only works on the servers. And the front end team only builds websites. 
And that front end team still may be split into designers and developers. Um, so it really depends on, on the company structure. Um, there's only so much we can crunch into a six month uh, program, right? But the idea here is that we consider any job placement in any technical related field a major success of the program. So you could get to the end of this program and say, I don't really want to be writing code as a job. I want to go be a designer. So I'm going to go take another couple month course on design, or I'm going to go find a YouTube series that I really like. And I'm going to take all of the knowledge that I have of the HTML and the grid system and all of that and apply it into my designs. That's a great outcome of the program, right? Oftentimes it isn't just about hey, we're producing full stack developers. It's that we're exposing you to so many different things that you can choose what career path you want to go down. Thank you. All right. Good to go. Okay. So we got our footer working. We've got our email link showing up nice. I'm feeling pretty good about this site, right? I'm ready to move on to what happens when we click on one of these buttons. So we've already played around with A tags. We know our email thing works up here. Now we're down here and I want to make it so when I click on that, right now it's just scrolling me to the top of the page. Well, that's because we haven't told it where to go. So we're going to go over to our files and we're going to create a new file called weather.html. We're going to hit enter on that, and we're going to use our little shortcut. We're going to use our exclamation point enter and have it drop all of the styling in for us, all the, the page structure. Then we come down into here. We're going to do an H1, and we're going to call it weather. Now, last thing I'm going to do on index.html, I'm switching back over here. I'm going to go find my weather link. That is this ahref right here. And I'm going to type in weather.html. Now, in order for this to work, weather.html has to be in the same folder as index.html. So if you have multiple fo folders open over here, make sure that your weather.html is in your day two folder. If we save and did everything right, when we come over here, go down to the make it rain button and click on it, I should end up on a very ugly, but very functional weather page. Anyone need help with that? Am I putting in every one of my columns? No, just the weather one. Uh, eventually, you'll go back and build out the separate ones. Artrell, go ahead. All right. So I created the new file, the weather.html. Yep. Did the exclamation point, enter. What do I do after that? You're going to go back to index.html. And down on our first A tag in the portfolio section, we're going to put in the file name weather.html. All right, so hold on, portfolio, weather. Oh, what is href equals A? Yep, you're going to so make that weather.html. All right, to make sure it works, I'm going to go over to mine. I click it, and then just the white page. Okay, so in your weather.html, add an H1 that says weather. Ah. Exona, go ahead. Um, So I don't know if you said this or not, Um, but in the weather that HTML, do we copy the one that we did with the weather app and just insert it in there? Is that, nope. or are we just gonna create something else? Okay. Hold cool. up there. Okay, I'm, I think I'm moving a little too ahead. 
Any other questions? Okay, so first things first, I click on weather and I'm like, man, I'm back at square one. I got to go build an entirely new page. This is annoying. But we don't need to buy, build an entirely new page. We can go back to our index.html and we're going to borrow two lines of code from it. We're going to borrow the whole bootstrap line because we want to use all of bootstrap in our weather page. And we also are going to borrow style.css because a lot of the styling that I have on my first page, I also want on my second page. So I'm going to go ahead and copy those two tags. I'm going to go back to my weather and above my title document, my title tag, I'm going to put in and paste in those two links. I am then going to change my document to weather while I'm at it before I forget. And when I switch back over here, now we've got this dark background. The weather each one is kind of hard to see, but we're making progress. We got our bootstrap working and we've got some of our styling from the first page showing up on our second page. Okay, now we can pick up a little speed here. We can say, hey, we want everything to be in a class called container, right? That's pulling in our bootstrap. Okay, now I'm thinking about this. Let's go back to our mock-up or our, our live site. Let's take a look here. And hmm, there's a nice little nav bar up at the top there. Now that doesn't look too hard, right? That looks like we could we could build that out ourselves. But look at what happens when I drag this in here, I get this nice little menu icon up at the top. And if I click on that menu, it opens up all of my links. That's quite convenient. That's nice for that mobile responsiveness. I wonder where we could get a fully pre-made component out of a framework we are already using. Oh, let's go to Bootstrap and see what's in over there. So I'm going to go over to the Bootstrap components. I'm going to go down to Navbar. And sometimes in Navbar, the first thing they show you is what we call the kitchen sink. It's got everything in this sucker. It's got a branded area. It's got a drop down. It's got a search bar. It's got disabled information. Way, way more than we need. It's going to take us more time to strip out some of these features than it would if we just found a more simple version of this. So we're going to keep scrolling down on the page. OK, here's the nav bar. It's showing us the brand, but it doesn't have any links in it yet. So we keep on going down. We don't want an image one. We don't want image and text. Oh, this one looks nice. It has a little disabled thing that we don't end up we won't end up needing to use but look at all of this html in here this is what we want this is what we're going to work with so instead of having to highlight all of this again make sure you're on the right one it should say navbar home features pricing and disabled i am only a quarter of the way scrolled down the screen there are so many different navbar options in here that we can mix and match but we just want the one as close to the basic one as, as we can get, right? So we're gonna copy this here. I'm gonna go back over to my code and inside my container, I'm gonna paste. You know that's a ton of code, but when I save it and come over here, I see my nav bar. Alexa, stop. I don't know what I said, but I triggered her. Okay, so we've got our nav bar in. I'm sorry, I was looking for the nav bar um, code. What do, what's the step again? Uh, in Bootstrap, I am scrolled down about a quarter of the way. You're looking for this specific nav bar. It says nav bar home features pricing and disabled. You want to find this in the Bootstrap page. Once you've done that, you can copy it to your clipboard from right here. Go over to your weather.html file and paste that nav bar inside of your container that we've made.
And what we should see, it's not going to look pretty, but we do have our nav bar showing up here. Hey, okay, can we pause for a second? Sure. Thanks. Because I had all this content in there copied from the index, but it looks like you should was, not. I should not. No. Whether we started as an empty HTML file, we did our exclamation point enter. And then we moved over our link tag for the style sheet and bootstrap. And that's it. The only thing that we moved over from index is the two link tags up at the top. Okay. Got rid of that. Now I have to find a nav bar. Um, where do I find that on the docs, please? Is it in forms? Uh, it's under components. Components, thanks. Okay. And we wanted the simple one. Okay. Let me just do a quick poll to see if you guys have that working. This is a very common thing to do is go look at your documentation. There's a time and a place for kind of typing everything out. Um, but there is also a time and place for saying there's a lot going on here. Let's just bring this over. Let's get it working. And then we can try and make some modifications there. Also, what I learned is if there's a um, if there's something that you're looking for, like let's say a form or container or whatever component you're looking for. If you put it on Google search and put, put bootstrap right after, it will send you right exactly to that page. And then you can just look at whatever you want. So that is, that's good really, tip. Really easy. There's also a search bar up at the top in bootstrap that you can also do a search for like nav and it will bring you right into the nav bar and the information related to it. Um, but that Google tip is certainly uh, a much more powerful one because mm -hmm. that is true not only for Bootstrap, but any language or framework that we're going to be using, right? So when we get into Node and Express, Google will learn. This is the scary part. Google will learn what languages you know how to develop in. Now, when I do a search for like filter array, which you guys, I know doesn't make any, any context yet. Google will give me all of my search results relating only to JavaScript. But if I go on someone else's other computer and do a search for that exact same thing, it's going to give me results for Python and PHP and JavaScript and all these other languages. So Google actually learns that you are a developer and will start filtering the search results to the languages that you search for most, which is uh, kind of cool. Mm, okay. Okay, so we got the vast majority of class uh, going here. So I need to roll forward. Archer, I'll go ahead. I feel like my indentation might not be right. Is it showing up right in your browser? On my browser at the top, it says nav bar home features pricing and disabled. This is a great segue into another tool that we are about to use. Some people love this tool. I have a, a hard time coding without it now um, because I use it as a crutch, but we've got all of this indentation going on here. And you know what? Even my indentation isn't right because my nav here is not lining up with my closing nav down here. Wouldn't it be nice if we used very expensive computers to just fix our indentation for us? All of our code is right, just take our code and make it a little bit prettier. Oh, let's, let's play off of that. We're going to go over to the extensions over here on the left. That's the icon above your live share icon. And up at the top where it says search extensions and marketplace, we are going to do a search for prettier. It should be the one with 25.4 million downloads. 
this top prettier. We don't want any of these other ones. This very top one, go ahead and click on install there. And it will install quite quickly. And now what happens, I forget if we need to turn it on. Uh, let's see, if we go to code preferences and settings up at the top. Uh, we've got autosave up here. That's fine. What we're going to do a search for is format on save. And we want to make sure this editor format on save is checked. We are then going to also do a search for formatter. And we want to make sure that the default formatter is set to code formatter. Or to set to prettier. Those should be set by default. If they're not, that's uh, go ahead and set them. Now, when we're in weather, go ahead and just save your file. All right, it laid everything out. It did indentation for us. Now we may not like the indentation that it's done, but it fixed all of our indentation for us and is now properly set up and properly indented. So my nav up at the top is lining up with my nav down at the bottom. Now, this is a very polarizing tool. Some people love code formatters because they fix all of their indentation for them. The other side benefit of them is when your code is not right, it will stop indenting and formatting properly. And that can be a great tool to go, oh, something's wrong. If my code isn't indenting properly, I must be missing a closing div tag or something must be wrong with my code. Let me fix that instead of powering through and having to find the issue later. So this is an optional tool. This is something that most students like to have on. This is something that I hated and I learned to love and now cannot write code without because it fixes everything for me. If you do not want to use this, you can go back up to code, preferences and settings. And when you do that search for format on save, just go ahead and uncheck that. That will disable Prettier from running and fixing your indentation. However, it's something that I would recommend you leave on for a week. Try and code with it. It's gonna be something that you don't like at the beginning, but give it a couple days, see if that helps you write your code and get your formatting in your indentation right. It's something that you won't like off the bat. Like I said, give it a couple days, see if you like it because it can be a really helpful tool. You said format on save, right? Correct. Um, Artrello, did that solve your indentation problem? I think so. It looks different, but I still have, you know, on my end. Oh, mine, it just still has the nav bar home features pricing disabled, but no other text below that. That's fine. That's all we have. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Exona, go ahead. Um, so I don't know if mine is supposed to look anything like yours, but it doesn't. What does it look like? I can uh, share my screen if you don't mind. You can now. Okay. Is that the one? Yeah. It looks like this. Okay. You, um, I believe yours is working. So the way you can test it is go to any one of those closing tags and hit tab a couple times so they're wrong. And then go ahead and save the file and see if that div tag moves back over. It does. So you are good to go. I probably have my level of indentation set to be a little bit higher. Um, mm -hmm. I find that that makes the code a little bit easier to read. Um, but um, let me see if I can adjust mine down so it doesn't do that. I um, think my my concern is the L, uh, the lists that you have. The allies and the ULs, that's yes. that's what I'm more concerned about because if it looks like this, this is fine, but. Where did, hmm. oh, did I copy the wrong, did I copy a different one? Because you don't have allies at all, do you? No, I, Where... went... 
I copied. Which one did I copy? Yeah, I think you just copied the. Um. Oh, there's a simpler one to copy. Okay, I see. I see the problem here. Um, it doesn't matter which one you have. Um, there are two okay. here. I copied gotcha. this first one that has these li links in them. Okay. If you went down and copied this one, yeah, um, that's what I did. I'm gonna copy this one because this one is even simpler than the one above it. Um, it doesn't matter which one you have. If you have this one or the one above it, it's completely fine. Um, that was not a prettier thing. That was just a wrong copy and paste. Um, okay. So All I'm right. gonna go <laughs> for the slightly simpler one. Um, but if you're, um, if you have the other one, that's okay. That won't cause any problems. Okay. Alba, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. When I go to the live, um, share. Yep. Bar, because my screen is smaller, it's not showing the other letters. So is there so, a hop somewhere that I could change that? I have to put it into full screen so I can see the letters besides the nav bar. Um, so you should be able to scroll left and right, just like you can scroll up and down with two fingers. No? Is this the way that it's showing up in the, in the Google? When you press the link and it takes you to that page that you have that has the nav bar home features pricing disabled? Yep. That right there. Yeah. I put it to a smaller screen to put it on the side. I can't see any of the. Oh, so the, this you're saying you get this menu icon, but it doesn't do anything, right? We're going to fix that in a second. That That's actually broken. Okay. So we're going to touch on that in one second. Because what it should be doing, right, is if we go back to the documentation and click on the menu, it should give us that little slide down. We're not getting that yet. That's broken for all of us. We'll get to the fix in a second. Uh, Jennifer, go ahead. I can't tell if mine's right or not because it doesn't look like there are things lining up. So that looks so. K, except you've got an H1 in there that should not be there. Go ahead and take that H1 out. Scroll back up to the top. Let's see if you've got an H1, a matching H1 at the top. You don't. So go ahead and save and see if your uh, formatting fixes and you're good to go. Thanks. Okay. So let's tackle that issue. We're in weather and we've got this nice little... Um, menu icon up here, but it's not working. What did we say? What kind of framework is bootstrap? What kind of category is it in? Grid? It's a CSS framework, right? And it gives us some HTML. HTML and CSS are always two peas in a pod. They always um, go together, right? But we're running into this issue where this isn't working. Well, this is actually some interactivity that we've built into the site, right? We're making it so when we say, hey, when we click on this button, we would like a menu to pop up. Well, that actually takes some JavaScript to pull off. Don't worry, we're not diving into JavaScript quite yet. We're not gonna write this JavaScript code, but there's actually a second step to getting Bootstrap to work that we've been skipping up until this point. That is including some JavaScript to make our interactivity functions of Bootstrap work. So while we're gonna go back to the Bootstrap website, we're gonna go all the way back up to the introduction where we've been finding our link tag. You see in this step two, there's the link tag that we know and love. But if you look, it says include Bootstrap CSS and JavaScript. Oops, we've been leaving that JavaScript out because we haven't needed it up until this point. But now our menu button is broken because we did not include our JavaScript. So we're going to go down to this script tag 
And we're going to copy that just like we copied our CSS. This is, again, docs, introduction, step number two, a couple lines down from where we find our link tag, we're also going to find our scripts tag. Copy that whole script tag. We're going to go back to our weather.html. And right at the bottom of the body, we're going to paste our script tag. And when we save, Prettier is going to try and help us out and make it a little bit easier for us to read everything going on in that script tag. Now, we don't need to worry about cross-origin or integrity or any of that. This script tag, the SRC, works just like the link href. All it's doing is going out to Bootstrap's website and pulling in the JavaScript that Bootstrap needs to make work. Now, there's no really no easy way of knowing whether or not we did this right. But if we did it right, now when we go to the weather, if we shrink our window down small enough to get our little menu bar up at the top, we, are, we should be able to click on that menu icon and get our links dropping down. OK, we haven't written our first lines of JavaScript yet but you have now used JavaScript in your own code. That should make it so when you click that menu button, the uh, things show up. And if you click on the menu again, the links should slide out of place. That is your first use of JavaScript. Hey, so why don't I have that? Have what? I don't have that bar that says nav bar at the top of your weather. OK, we copied and pasted the code right in here. Do you have this code? I do. OK, do you see a section that says toggle navigation? If you could see the words on top next to the nav bar, then you're not going to have that button. You got to make your screen smaller and the buttons will show up and the letters will go away. Yeah, so it's responsive. If, you're, if your page is wide, you won't have the menu. You'll see all the links here. But if you pull your window down to be a little uh, more narrow, then this menu icon should show up. I'm wondering if I just have to change my go live because it's not. If you need help, I can put you in a, a breakout room. I had to make it go live again. Okay. And then I have it. Cool. Sometimes it it the go live gets a little funky and you need to refresh it. Glad you got it working. Yes. Arch drop, go ahead. All right, to make sure I'm doing this correctly. Yes. On my page, after I inserted that, that script line. Yep. When I hover the, the arrow over nav bar, home, and features, it should go from arrow to like a finger, right? Uh, yeah. All right, that's all we were doing right now. Yes. And if you take the window and kind of make it less wide, you should get your links at the top should go away and you should get a menu icon instead. On, on which, which window? In your browser. If you just make the browser window less wide, the links should disappear and you should get a menu icon instead. Let me try that. Yes. And if you click that menu icon, you should get the drop down. This is our first uh, attempt at responsive web design. Yes. OK, then you're good to go. Thank you. OK, so I would like my nav bar to look like the nav bar on our live site. If I reposition my windows here, we can see OK, I've got my home about contact, but I want to start diving into that. So what I'm going to do here is instead of using a BG light, I am going to use a BG dark. So I come back over here. No, that doesn't look right. 
what if we also, instead of just using a BG dark, we also set the whole nav bar to dark? Okay, now I got my text in white and this looks nice, but Max, how could I ever have known that nav bar dark was an appropriate class name to use? Well, if I go back over to my nav bar documentation, over here in the color schemes, I can click on that and it will show me that BG dark and nav bar dark are an option just like BG primary, or I can set my own custom background color. Well, that's kind of cool. Let's, let's practice with that. I'm going to go over to my style.css. I am going to target my nav. I think I'm going to target my nav. I'm going to reference the code I've already written and I'm cheating off of to make sure that I do this right. Uh, I'm going to target the BG dark that we just added as a class right here. And of course, I'm using a period here. And I'm going to set my background color to that. Come over here. And it hasn't changed. Like, OK. Sometimes when we're modifying our bootstrap code, the bootstrap code is very persistent. It's like, no, BG dark is this color. And we're like, well, we don't want it to be that color. What we can do is say it's important that it is that color. Now we come over here and we get my nav bar styling looking the way that I want. Or did you have another question or did the did you not lower your hand? Okay, so we're gonna do our final push here and switch over to terms mode. I have my nav bar, I've got all my links at the top. Now all I need to do is make my links line up. So I'm going to come back to my A tags over here and I'm going to say, hey, my brand shows up all the way up here at the top. Because this is my portfolio site, I want the brand to say my name. And where we're going to link that to is back to my index page. When I click on my name, I want it to take me back to my home page. Now, all the way down here, my first link says home. That should also take me back to my index.html. Now I have this link called features. I don't want features. I want a section called about. So I'm going to change my features to about. And I'm going to get fancy here. My about section is on my index.html but I can actually link to a specific ID in my about in my index.html by calling it about. So this pound sign is lining up with the ID that we have on index.html, and it's linking me specifically to that section. So I'm going to finish this up. I've got my contact. I've got index.html and my contact. And then down here, I'm going to take out my disabled because I don't want that link to be disabled. I'm going to do another index.html to my portfolio section. And I'm going to call this portfolio. And I'm going to attempt to spell it right. So when I save, my code went somewhere. I'm like, oh, this is prettier. This is prettier trying to help you out, trying to say, hey, that's one really long line of code. So we're going to break it up onto separate lines to make that code a little bit easier for you to read. So I come over here. Notice all of my links look right. And if I click on contact, it scrolls me right to the contact section. Now keep in mind, our nav bar is not up at the top here. It's only on my weather page. 
So I need to go back to the weather page and I can click on any of the links here and it will take me back to my home page. We're stopping there for the night. I'm gonna give you guys like three minutes to catch up, then we'll go into terms mode and then we'll go from there. Again, I know this is coming at you fast. It's more important that you understand what we're changing than it is that you have it working, right? So if you get to this point and you're like way too fucking fast, that happens, right? Take a step back and say, do I understand what steps Max is taking? Do I understand the code in the way that the computer is running that code? That is a hundred times more important than this code looking the same way. I know that's the gratification point, right? I know that's when you get it working and you're like, but that's the rewarding thing. Mine looks like his. That's not the important thing. The important thing here is that you can look at these steps that we're taking and say, I get why Max is modifying this about. This about right here is what's changing the word that shows up in the nav bar. Okay, why is he changing this href? This href is controlling where the link goes when he clicks on it. That's what we wanna be thinking about in class here, right? Yes, doing it and reinforcing it and getting the practice with it is all important. In the workforce, you're gonna need to be able to do all of that, but it's much more important to understand the steps and how the computer is interpreting those steps than it is to actually get your code working. Alba, go ahead. So we are changing the disabled and we're making it portfolio and adding the href? Correct. So the disabled is just an example to show you that like, hey, if you do want a link that isn't clickable, um, you, can, you can do that. Um, but we just said, no, we don't actually need a disabled link in our nav bar. Let's just take that out. And if you wanted to, if you needed an entirely separate uh, link in here, you could take this whole A tag. You don't have to follow me. I'm just doing this as an example. Paste it and say, I want a link to Google for some reason. And you could change this href to google.com and you would get another link in your nav bar to Google. And if you click on it, it will take you right to Google, right? So we don't necessarily, if there are too many A tags in here or not enough A tags in here, we can always add more or take them out. And Bootstrap will still work when we crunch that down, when we go to the menu. Now we've got our link to Google in here and can click on that and get to it. So we don't necessarily need to follow Bootstrap to the letter. Bootstrap is just that framework, right? It's given us the flexibility so that we can put in more links or, or take some out. All right. And the only thing that we did was change the name, put an href to index HTML in onto our name, and then did the home, um, home about contact and portfolio. You got it. And if that is all working, on the weather page on your nav bar, you should be able to click on any of those links and get to the right section on the home page. So when you're feeling that it's going too fast, take that step back too and go, okay, why is he going so fast? Oh, it turns out that he's just changing the same thing over and over again, right? Sometimes that you find like, well, I'm six steps behind. No, you're one step behind. We just did that step six times in a row, 
right? So that's what we're we're working our way up to is like, I can't, what, what did he just change, right? It's like, okay, he's changing the thing between the A tag and the href itself, right? And yes, we did that one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. But sometimes when you're feeling like you're five steps behind, sometimes you're only one step behind. We just did it five times. Out of curiosity, I'm going to launch a quick poll. And Ariel has posted the 30-second feedback. That is uh, helpful to us as always. But were you able to keep up with all of this? And if you don't keep up with it, please put it in the feedback so that I can tell him to slow down or speed up, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm here for you guys. I am too, but you know, I like to go fast. You know what kind of car I drive. It's clear that I like to go fast. But understanding is much more important. We have an entire day left on this project, right? Where we're going to uh, build out that other page. We're going to get more practice with this. And we've got an entire week after this to work with that Netflix page. But you guys also have to communicate with us, right? So if you're feeling really behind, that, that does not magically resolve itself. That, that's why we have our one-on-ones, right? That's why when you're behind, you could have that one thing that's holding you break back from the dam breaking and everything, the floodgates opening, right? So schedule those one-on-ones. If those one-on-ones are, are, if I'm not available, either shoot me a message if you want to meet with me or check to see if Ariel's available or any of the other TAs, Mel or uh, Karen, or um, we've got that list in Canvas, right? When you go to Canvas and take a look right up at the top, we've got our Calendly links in here. When you open that Calendly, here are all of our links. You can just go in and book with us directly. It shows up on my calendar. We're gonna work with you and, and get that working, right? But it's, it's going to be so much better if you aren't afraid to ask for help now and get it, then it's going to be when you're now three weeks behind and now it may be too late to catch up, right? So even if you're only feeling a day behind, schedule that one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to see where you're at, right? We can help you. Obviously, you've got to invest the time in it for us to be able to help you, but we can help make sure at an individual level that you're investing the time where you need to. And also take a step back and say, did I understand what he did in class? No, 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 I'm, I'm feeling like you went fast, but am I actually understanding this? Did I build what he built? Or did I follow along during class and then took some time and tried and did a couple things on my own and got it working? If it did, there's a difference between fast and imposter syndrome. Yeah, it may feel fast, but if you're able to keep up, give, your, give yourself uh, a little credit there. This is a lot. Look at the site that we just built. Okay, I only have two minutes left. Alba, do you still have a question? Okay. Sorry, I'm not always the best at lowering hands. Okay, let's switch over. I know it's close to the end of class. Yeah, I hit on that imposter syndrome. I know you guys feel it. Sometimes there is genuine calls for concern. Sometimes it is just imposter syndrome. I lost the outline for tonight. What week are we in? I don't even know anymore. Week four, day two. Okay. What terms popped up? And we'll fill this outline out a little bit more after class so that we can break down those steps and have the sections captured. Um, I think that's actually in the portfolio steps down here if you're looking for it. Um, okay, what terms did we learn tonight or concepts or things that we would like to capture into a definition? HREF mail to? HREF mail to.
What else? Hit on JavaScript. Um, JavaScript. Uh, I'm going to specifically say Booch. Uh, well, Link. Uh, yeah, we'll say um, a way to uh, language used to make our websites interactive first used to include bootstrap pre-written javascript in order to make the mobile menu in the nav bar work what else link buttons with um where they need to go um And, I, and as always, if you don't agree with a definition or want to uh, expand upon it, don't be afraid to come off mute and let me know. Anything else? Minimal viable product. Minimal viable product. The smallest thing we can build that is still functional for the end user. Use the card link from um, Bootstrap. Um, we're going to say pre-built components using entirely uh, designed components to um, create a user interface without needing to build the CSS from scratch. Set in a copyright? Uh, copyright yeah. and semantic footer element uh, using the emoji picker on the Mac to make the. Ooh, bad Google Docs. All right, I'll just copy it. Uh... Google, you're killing me. <laughs> Anything else? Um, oh, that a prettier extension. Ooh, good one. Prettier. Um, uh, extension in VS Code and other editors that fixes our formatting to its own opinionated standard, right? And what I mean by opinionated is that Prettier doesn't hide it. In mm -hmm. fact, if you go onto the Prettier website and take a look here, their tagline is an opinionated formatter. In other words, they think that this is the best uh, standard to indent your code. And if you don't like it, too bad. It's their opinion that they like it like indented that way. While that is uh, a strong statement to make, um, when everyone agrees on your team to use Prettier, all the code is always formatted the exact same way. And that makes it easier to read no matter who has written it. What about text area? Text area. I don't know if we, did we touch up on that before? A form input, probably not in class, maybe in your homework assignment, a form input um, like uh, input, uh, like type equals text, but provides a bigger area for the user to type into. Okay. I hope if I spelled area right. <laughs> 
There will be things that you learn outside of class that you need to do for your homework. That is the life of a developer, right? We won't mm -hmm. always touch on everything, um, but that is usually intentional, right? Because that's getting you guys practice reading the documentation. When you guys get to the end of this and you need to, to uh, build something at work, you're going to need to read the documentation in order to figure that out, right? That is all part of the life of a developer. Anything else for tonight? I know we're already over. Sorry for keeping you guys. Um, also, I just wanted to talk. I know that, um, was it, I believe it was Chris who posted the link to complete something. Can you talk about that a little bit more? No, because I don't know who Chris is or what link yeah. you're talking about. Uh, what was his name? The guy uh, who's in charge of the stipend. I'm sorry. I Jason. Was... Yes. So he posted a link on, uh, sorry, I have so many open Slack channels um, on Slack. Yeah. So if you go to the student success channel, um, Jason has, I, I'm pretty sure everyone completed the link for the card enrollment, which is probably what you're thinking of all the way up from last Wednesday. Um, he will be at Common Space from 4.30 to 5.30 on Friday, this upcoming Friday, and also there Monday, 10.24 from 4.30 to 5.30 to hand okay. out your stipend debit cards that you guys can spend on whatever you want. And it will be loaded with, it's roughly $240 a month. Um, but when you get the card, it should have instructions on like how to check your balance and sign into it and all of that stuff. Um, but you got to pick up your card first. Um, you can either uh, vote on either one of those two times um, if you want to pick it up in person, or if you would rather have it just mailed to you, you can pick option four in the poll there. Um, and then you'll get it in the mail. And the when you pick up the card, it will have activation instructions on it as well. You just put in another post at 628 that he will be available in the common space between 4 and 530 on Friday for the stipends to be picked up. And also on Monday, yes. Perfect. I just saw that. Sorry, I have so many channels on because I have okay. my work loaded to it. We will also be sending out a message about um, co-working memberships. Um, we have two different options there. Um, one, we can use some funds that we have in the program and kind of um, all, uh, supplement the cost of the co-working membership. Um, so we've got, um, I need to post a poll about whether you guys would rather have eight to five access or you would rather have after hours access. So like 5.30 to however late do you guys want to work there? Um, or if you would rather try and have something in between of like 12 to 8.30 so that you guys could, um, you know, still tune in from class at Common Space. Um, but I believe the option that we're leaning towards is um, us paying $40 for the membership. And then you guys can use your stipend cards um, to pay for the other $40 of that membership, or you could use your stipend card and get 24 hour access to common space if you would prefer that. Um, so I will be posting two polls in um, the Slack channel. Um, and I'll remind you guys of that tomorrow. Okay. How much is the 24 hour? Um, I don't believe that we have a discount on that. So the 24 hour I want to say is 200 a month um so you would be using almost your full stipend amount um, and the other one the the one so we should wait wait and will you know by friday or we should just wait i i'll post the poll uh by tomorrow's class and remind you guys to vote in it and then we'll decide based off the results of that um trying to find workspace plans um it is
Where is the Max, you want to put me on that for tomorrow? Uh, sure. Got it. Stupid. I can't find on their website the pricing plan. I'm pretty sure it's 200 because it's 150 normally for eight to five access. And then they gave us a little flexibility to be able to slide that. Um, but there were, I cannot find on their website where the 24 hour access plan is. So I will have to get back to you on that. I've already kept you guys over. Um, I will stick around in case people have questions. Um, but otherwise you guys are good to go for this evening and uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. Uh, can you post the slack, post the code mm -hmm. in the slack? Uh, doing that now. One. Two. And. Three. You were good to go. I'm confused. It says um, on here the comments be 